I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. We begin with breaking news. You know that we are covering two huge cases, jury selection underway in both of them. But as I sit here right now tonight on this Monday night, we have a jury in the case against Kyle Rittenhouse in Kenosha, Wisconsin, where jury selection began today. Jury selection began today. They have a jury tonight. Not so much the case down in South Georgia in Brunswick in the case against Ahmad, uh, against the two, three men accused of murdering Ahmad Arbery. We will uh, bring you the latest in a live report from Brunswick, Georgia, coming up in just a little bit. But this is uh, big news, which means the trial involving the shooting death of three men, the shooting death of two men, the shooting of three men in Kenosha, Wisconsin during those riots. They've got a jury in just one day. This just happening moments ago. Okay, so looks like from where I'm sitting here tonight that the, the trial against Kyle Rittenhouse will begin before the trial against Travis Gregory McMichael and Roddy Bryan begins in Georgia. So let's do this. Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter has the entire backstory for you tonight, how we got to the point where we are right now with a jury selected. Take a listen. The following video includes graphic content. Viewer discretion is advised. I am an EMT. If you are injured, come to me. This is 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse, just hours before he would become a household name. He's one of many armed civilians patrolling the streets of Kenosha on the night of August 25th, 2020. So people are getting injured, and our job is to protect this business, and part of my job is to also help people. If there's somebody hurt, I'm running into harm's way. That's why I have my rifle, because I need to protect myself, obviously. But I also have my med kit. And while he doesn't know it yet, he is clearly in over his head. Chaos erupted in Kenosha overnight. Large fires engulfed dump trucks and law enforcement appeared to deploy tear gas to disperse large crowds. The protest began after cell phone video of the officer involved shooting of 29 year old Jacob Blake went viral. <laughs> During the first night of demonstrations, garbage trucks were set on fire. Protesters threw rocks and broke windows at the courthouse and multiple businesses in downtown Kenosha were set ablaze. One of those businesses was a used car lot named Car Source. In the daylight, you could see charred remains of a used car lot. There are two other Car Source locations on Sheridan Road. Cal Rittenhouse spent most of the night here, close to the destroyed lot. But shortly before midnight, he left and walked to a different Car Source lot four blocks away, where he would allegedly shoot the first of three men. Two videos appear to capture the shooting. In the first one, it's difficult to see. This is Kyle Rittenhouse. Joseph Rosenbaum is here. They both move out of the frame and disappear behind a car before gunshots erupt. Oh. This is a second video from a different angle. Here, you can see Rittenhouse before shots are fired. And here, you can see Joseph Rosenbaum. But look closely to the far left, just beyond the lot. Look for a flash. Somebody discharges a weapon seconds before Kyle Rittenhouse starts shooting. After the shooting, Rittenhouse walks around the black sedan, then seems to look down at Rosenbaum as he takes out his cell phone. The shooting sparks a chase down Sheridan Road. That's when Brendan Gutenschwager turns on his camera. People were immediately um, yelling at him, saying, get him, grab him. Um, he just shot somebody. In hot pursuit was Anthony Huber, holding the skateboard and Gage Grosscourts, armed with a gun. They were chasing after him, and at a certain point, he tripped and fell, the man with the gun. And so then as people started to close in on him and surround him, he started firing off at them. During the confrontation, Rittenhouse shoots and kills Anthony Huber and seriously injures Gage Grosskreutz. The shooter just got up and proceeded to walk towards the line of police um, that were there in the Bearcat and a couple vehicles. And he basically just walked right up to them with the gun still out in front of him. 
Rittenhouse was not arrested and drove back to his home in Illinois that same night. A few hours later, accompanied by his mother, the 17-year-old turned himself in to police. Do you want to have a lawyer in this circle, yes or no? I would like a lawyer, but I'm willing to talk until a lawyer is available. Kyle Rittenhouse was taken into custody just before 8 a.m. What is he looking at? Uh, it could range anywhere from uh, reckless injury to reckless homicide to second-degree homicide. I don't know yet. It's all going to depend on... Murder? That's what homicide is, yeah. correct. correct. <laughs> Rittenhouse claims he acted in self-defense, but prosecutors disagree. They intend to prove that the high school student acted with purpose and was looking for trouble when he shot three people, killing two. The defendant came to our community. He's not a resident. He's underage. He's out after curfew. He's armed with an illegal weapon. Why? That is the question. His state of mind, his intent that night, is a crucial issue in this case. It is without debate, Judge. All three of these people were chasing Kyle Rittenhouse. All of them. That is, that is not debatable. Once again, our breaking news tonight is that a jury has been selected. Just one day, the judge on the bench right now speaking with those jurors. Let's take you in. Your, the plans for tomorrow, Mrs. Uh, Mateska Mentik will discuss with you and will be a different arrangement entirely, and that will continue for the duration of the trial. Um, you don't need to bring food because uh, that will be taken care of, and we will be taking... Uh, uh, as brief of a break as is consistent with uh, giving you uh, enough time to sit down and, and relax and, and uh, enjoy your lunch. Um, and um, um, the bailiffs will escort you in each day. Um, oh, and of course, don't read, watch, or listen to anything about the case. Now, I'm, there was a time when I could tell juries that, and I would tell them just, you know, don't, don't watch the news. Well, now there's such an abundance of information out there, online, uh, over the radio, over the television, whatever else, on your phone. Um, and it's in a lot of places. Some of these sports uh, Sports sites even have discussions about this case. This case is certainly uh, well known about throughout the country. So be very selective. And in the event that you land on something that you even hear anything to do with this case, just switch right away to uh, Disney Plus uh, or some, some other site that um, is not going to have anything about the trial and uh, do that. As I've said before, you're in the command seat. You're going to know more about this case than anyone in the world. And you're going to know a lot more than anybody who's giving information out over the media. So keep that in mind uh, so that you can be fair and discharge that duty we talked about at the beginning of being fair and impartial, informed to the best of the ability of these very capable, competent, and interesting attorneys can make it. And um, we can go smoothly, I hope, through this case. And, uh, and you'll be able to, as I said earlier, this can be a moment of such pride to our community if you do what the founders of the country hoped. So please keep that in mind. And with that, uh, I'm going to ask the media to leave again because we're done. And uh, Mrs. Mataskamentik is going to discuss jury arrangements, which are uh, not for your uh, ears. So. We have a jury. One day. One day uh, in, in the case. They're going to, it looks like they're going to begin tomorrow. Let's bring in our think tank, get a little bit of reaction to all of this because this is so... Um, a little bit surprising, but not totally shocking because we thought it was going to take two days. Joining us in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, criminal defense attorney, civil rights attorney, Casey Early. In Houston, Texas, criminal defense attorney, Brian Weiss. 
and in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney Michael Bixon. Um, KC, uh, I was going to go to you first, but I'm just going to throw this one at Brian uh, first, if you don't mind. Uh, Brian, I always say jury selection uh, is like pasta fajol. Um, you go, you get it in three different places, three completely different recipes. It'll look different. It all is good. It all works, but it's all completely different. It's up to the chef how they make it. It's up to the judge how long jury selection takes. One day here. This is a high-profile case. This is our trial of the century this year. And I want to give major props to Judge Bruce Schroeder, who, as the longest-serving, longest-tenured circuit judge in the great state of Wisconsin, has done a masterful job of taking a complicated case where everybody in the free world seems to have some sense of what happened that night in Kenosha and turned around in literally record time and given us a jury of 12 and four alternates. I think that Judge Schroeder, because of his tenure and because of his experience, is exactly the kind of judge who we want calling balls and strikes. And look, you don't have to be a sports fan and it doesn't have to be fall baseball to recognize that what's going to unfold in this Kenosha courtroom is, is literally game seven of the World Series. There's nobody I'd rather have behind home plate calling balls and strikes than Judge Bruce Schroeder. Ben. All right. Uh Casea, I mean, this is uh, pretty shocking to me that it was done in one day, such a high-profile case, but it's up to the judge. That is correct. It's oftentimes how the judge is efficient in the courtroom. I've tried many cases, and sometimes a misdemeanor took uh, forever, and then a felony case that was punishable by life was fast and efficient. It's how the judge pushes the case and how much time was allotted for this jury selection. So in this case, although two days seem to be uh, fast compared to other high-profile cases, I do believe that, uh, of course, this is a very experienced judge, and he moved this case with efficiency, and we got the expected results. Yeah, I mean, day-to-day -day trials, you get a jury in one day. It's just we're not used to it at Court TV because it's always super high profile. Michael, hold on one second. We've got Court TV crime and justice reporter Joy Lynn Nakram, who's in Kenosha, joining us by phone right now. Joy, how did they get the jury this quickly? Uh, give us the rundown of, of, of what, what transpired in Kenosha. Yeah, Vinny, I really, uh, and it, it, with incredible speed, they moved to select this jury. Uh, we started the day, we had 80 jurors in the courtroom, 150 in pool. Some of them were, were remote. By 7.35 p.m. tonight, the court was down to 34 jurors after the rest were excused for cause. So that was a number of causes. For some, it was scheduling issues, child care issues. Uh, but some, it, it, were, it was causes that were really kind of at the heart of the case. Uh, there were, of course, a series of questions asked by the defense team as well as the prosecution. For instance, uh, juror number 30 was excused after questioning by Corey Sherafisi, uh, the defense attorney. And she's a woman who raised her hand saying she, she had a problem with using a weapon like that uh, in, in public. And she would have difficulty judging the case fairly, for instance. And, and we heard that sentiment echoed several times. We also heard uh, several jurors raise concerns about really having public pressure, uh, regardless of the outcome of the verdict, that the, the eyes of the world were really on them. We heard many jurors express reluctance to even serve on the panel, and it was something that kind of became a, a running joke between the attorneys and the judge. Uh, there, there were other jurors, for instance, one juror who it was a, a white man in his 20s excused later in the day after 7.35 p.m. when it was already down to uh, just as kind of the smaller list of jurors. And, and he, he expressed that he had read that Rittenhouse was in a militia. Uh, and, and so, of course, the defense took issue with that. That juror was dismissed for cause as well. But we are down to a jury of, of 11 women and the nine men now. So it, it's a panel of 20 jurors or 12 jurors, eight alternates. And uh, yeah, so that's 20 jurors that are going to hear this case now. Um, and opening statements expected to begin tomorrow. And I think you already laid out some of this. The court was down to that 34 jurors by 7.35 p.m. Um, and then they've got down to 20 very quickly. Those seven preemptory strikes exercise really in just a matter of minutes. Pretty clear that the attorneys for each side had been paying very close attention to exactly what jurors they wanted on this panel and what jurors they did not. Let me ask you, Joy, because this is a, a case very divisive and really um, 
from the viewers and people I've spoken to, is, it breaks down by political uh, parties and, and political leanings. Those who lean to the right tend to support uh, Kyle Rittenhouse and the Second Amendment. Those who lean to the left are, are supporting the demonstrators and, and the gunshot victims. So were there any questions about politics for these jurors? Oh, yeah. Absolutely, 100%. And, and there were many people who um, raised actually concerns, jurors who raised concerns about their politics uh, informing their judgment as to this case. But the judge was very clear that politics really don't belong in this case. And, you know, regardless of one's politics, uh, if you feel that you can be objective and if the court deems that, that, that one can be uh, a fair and impartial juror, then they will proceed because, after all, uh, the jury is supposed to be somewhat reflective of the community. And so we could expect a, a variety of political backgrounds. I mean, the expectation is for people to not have – is not to, for people to have no beliefs, right? That's just, Every, everybody's <laughs> that's got – everybody has one. The, the problem is with this case, what you believe is the way you see – those videos from every guest that I've had on this show, from people I've spoken to in the newsroom to um, just people talking about the case online. So, so let me ask you, did, did the attorneys, were they able to get that information from the jurors, like who you voted for or, or which way you lean to the right, to the left? Did, did that come out? Is that known by the attorneys or were there other questions um, unrelated to that where you'd have to glean uh, which way they lean? So I would say that the politics was kind of a subtext to it. You know, no one said, hey, are you are you a Republican? Are you a Democrat? But the questions were more, uh, how do you feel about the Second uh, Second Amendment? How do you feel about gun rights? There were a lot of questions about gun ownership. And we found that in this pool of jurors, there were many people who uh, were either gun owners or had gun owners in, in their family, people who, uh, you know, were very much believers in, in the Second Amendment and, and the right to bear arms. And nevertheless, I mean, it, it came down to a question of whether these jurors, regardless of their personal beliefs, uh, could could decide fairly on this case and, and put their beliefs aside, put what they had known and uh, I guess what they've gathered about the case through media aside, and just determine this case based on the facts presented to them. Amazing. All right. Opening statements tomorrow, correct? Absolutely. Starting at 9 a.m. after this, uh, you know, this jury has been selected really with lightning speed. Very late, late night for everyone here, but uh, they got to be ready to go bright and early tomorrow, Benny. All right. Joy Lim Nakrin, thank you so much. Court TV crime and justice reporter live in Kenosha tonight. Um, let me just go back to the think tank really quickly. Michael Bixon, um, your, your thoughts about this lightning fast jury selection and, and, ev and eventually... Um, you know, to me, politics is what this was all about from the beginning in terms of figuring out which way, which jurors would be better for the prosecution, which would be better for the defense. Uh, your thoughts? Well, you know, honestly, I'm surprised that, one, they got it done this quick, and I'm blown away by that, but two, in the manner that they got it done. I mean, it's one thing to do something just fast, but not right, but I think they did a really good job at the whole process, and I think the job is, uh, the judge has been absolutely terrific through the entire process. Um, you know, it, just staying lighthearted, um, you know, I don't think that that sort of does anything in a negative way towards the courtroom and it keeps jurors engaged, which is a very important thing, especially in a trial this serious. So, so far, I, you know, I think that they've done an excellent job. I think it's amazing they have come through the jury selection process this quick, especially in a case this serious. Unbelievable. All right. The think tank is staying with us the whole night when we come back, like we've been saying. It's a huge week here on Court TV. Two big trials. One is going to begin tomorrow. The other one, they're still picking the jury. A live report from Brunswick, Georgia when we come back.